Sam. Welcome to Money 911. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Chris. I've really been looking forward to sharing some stories and insights with your community. I appreciate it. And, you know, you were you were a divine blessing for me. Uh, I don't know. We were trying to figure out how long ago, but, you know, the early 2000s. And when I first wrote my book, you helped me take my number one best-selling book, Ready for Pre-Retirement, Plan Retirement Early, right? You helped me develop all of that conversation because I was clueless. And so I'm very grateful for you. And You know, I, I have such good memories of that. And one of the things we focus on is how can we be one of a kind instead of one of many, right? In a crowded world, we don't just need another book on retirement or on uh, wealth, investments, financial management, et cetera. And I thought you had a kind of first of its kind idea that we hadn't seen before and that would help the book break out. It did help the book break out and, and and it was a number one and it's been generating, you know, lots of conversations and, and speaking and events for for a long time. And and I just wanna I didn't get to tell you, but I'm ready. I'm also launching a course called Create Income You'll Never Outlive. So taking all those years, putting it together and being able to help millions of people protect their assets. But it was all about the language in the conversation. And by the way, financial planners or people that are similar to do what I do, but they're not like who I am, they're all starting to go, you should brand yourself. You should be different. They're all having the conversation we had almost 15 or so years ago. And I really like, you know, I kind of broke it up in, in uh, four different segments here. and. I wanted to, you know, navigate the workplace dynamics and and you in the first segment was cracking the eggshells at work. <laughs> right? <laughs> Go right to it, right? We're not going to just talk on eggshells. We're going to crack those eggshells, huh? That's right. <laughs> Why not? Well, you know, you have, you have a delicate balance on how, you know, what you're saying here. So, you know, there's a lot of angles to get into it. Well, here's a tip then. It's uh, let's talk about real life situations so that people think I've always wanted to know what to say when that happens or, oh, I wish I'd known this Friday. So unless Perfect. people are driving, I hope they get a piece of paper and they put um, three columns on it. So you and I will talk about some real life situations, what to do if someone's taking their anger out on us, what to do if someone's blaming us for something that's not our fault, what to do if someone's complaining. And then the middle column is going to be what not to say and do. And then that final column on the right is what to say and do. So that instead of blurting out what's at the tip of our tongue, we actually say something that helps instead of hurts. Sound like a plan? It sure does. Fabulous. Okay. So let's talk about what to do if people complain. So first column, if people complain, middle column, don't explain. Because explanations come across as excuses. They actually make people angrier because they feel we're not being accountable. And now over on the right, put the A train. A for agree, A for apologize, A for act. So if someone says, you were supposed to send that to me last week. Oh, I know we're short staffed right now. So we got behind it. No, explanations come across as excuses. Instead, A for agree. You're right. We were supposed to send that to you last week. A for apologize. And I'm sorry you haven't received it yet. A for act. And if I can confirm your address, we're going to make sure it goes out priority mail today. Do you see how the A train expedites complaints? Explanations aggravate them. Absolutely. And 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 I need this class. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's and it's perfect real life examples because you know it really is just. If people have this, they'll be able to communicate so much better. And and so balancing the eggshells, you know, at work, at home, get, maybe give a, a, an example of at home. Oh, I love this. Well, I was visiting my son, Andrew, in New York, and his one-year-old son, Hero, was crawling across the floor. He hauled himself up on a guitar on a stand in a corner. He starts banging on the strings. 
Now, in that middle column, so actually the situation here is somebody does something wrong. Someone makes a mistake or they're doing something they shouldn't. In the middle column, I'll tell you what Andrew did and what we're going to do that followed his very wise response instead of reaction. Instead of yanking the guitar away, instead of saying no, instead of saying stop pounding on the guitar, Andrew said one word. Do you know what it was, Chris? No gentle. And I saw Hero's face transform. And he reached back up to the guitar. He went strong, strong, Mm. strong. And he made music in that moment, because in the middle column, instead of being a critic and criticizing what he was doing wrong, Andrew was a coach and coached him on how to do it right. Mm. Instead of shaming his behavior, he shaped it So instead of losing face over that, Hero actually learned from it. So in the workplace or at home, if someone makes a mistake and we're about to tell them what not to do or what to stop doing or what they shouldn't do, no, 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 coach instead of criticize, shape instead of shame, tell them what to start doing instead of to stop doing and what we do want instead of what we don't. Now we're making them feel better instead of making him feel bad. Oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. Okay. So, so, um, I have somebody that I work with and Mm -hmm. their response every time, you know, like I'm sending them things to do or something is like, and there it's always comes back at, I told you. And it's really like you stupid fool. I've told you this a million times. Well, whoops, I forgot. Well, that's an excuse, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. But that's, it's an, it's a pattern. And I'm just using a real life example that happens and they're good hearted people, but they get into this sort of a, you know, you stupid fool. I've told you that a million times. And then you don't want to even talk to them and, and you diminish in your, in your energy. Right. That's true. So now are we talking a work situation or, or a personal situation? It's work. Mm -hmm. Okay. If especially if we are their supervisor or if we are a coworker and the situation is people are making an excuse, right? Is like right. that they are, or is it they're attacking us? Is it they're making an excuse for not doing what they're supposed to be doing, or they're attacking us and insulting us? They're attacking us and assaulting us because maybe I might ask a question, how do you do this? And then and they might tell me, or maybe I forget, or maybe I d- did it the wrong sequence and and this is an interesting thing because when people have a certain kind of a brain, like the linear brain, and I'm more of a creative brain, and I'm all over the place, they don't really mesh very well. That's what I've seen, right? So so let's talk about those two different scenarios. Is right. that part of talking on eggshells is being a pattern interrupt. And I believe that if people are verbally abusing us, especially if they're calling us names, well, that was a stupid mistake. It's like, um, you know, I can't believe you're incompetent or something (laughs) like that. We interrupt them. We do not give them a bully pulpit. So in the middle of them uh, uh, verbally abusing us, calling us derogatory names, we interrupt them and we use their name because their name will often cause a pause. So Mm. if we say Rob, if we say uh, Barbara, they will stop for just a moment and then we'll say, I will say this once, please speak to me with respect. Now, it's really important, use their name, cause a pause. Number two, say, I'll say this once. Because if we just say, hey, you know, I don't like it when you call me names, or I don't think that's fair, we are actually adding fuel to their fire. Mm. So when we say, I will say this once, and this works with kids too, and then we speak low and slow. Now, if they continue, we say, this conversation is over. You are welcome to call back or you are welcome to get back in touch when you're ready to speak to me with respect. Because now we're holding them accountable for respectful behavior. We told them we would say it once. We do not repeat it. And if then they uh, pile on abuse, then we end the conversation until they're ready to speak to us with respect. That's hot. And, and that would work even if it's like in a text or email with that. Yeah, st- that's, 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 that's just correct. the positioning. So 
You just don't allow it into the space. This is this is really such a valuable. You know, this is so important. I think that people, if they people could understand what you're saying, we would be able to communicate. And right. <laughs> You know, Chris, it's, I'll always remember it was, there was a woman in one of my Tung Fu and Talking on Eggshell workshops, right. and she had gone through a divorce and her ex was verbally abusive and he would call and he would, you know, he would just rant and rave. Right. And because there was custody of the kids, she felt she had to listen because sometimes buried in there was something about who was going to take the kids for the weekend or whatever. And I said, okay, no, do two things. And I've checked with divorce attorneys. So this is something that they recommend as well, is that is that you send this person, once again, a pattern erupt email. You say, in the past, you have been verbally abusive to me in our phone calls or in our text or in our emails. I will say this once. From now on, you will speak to me with respect. And that means no name calling on text emails or phone calls mm. at the first sign of disrespect i will erase the text i will erase the email you know or i will end the phone call and if it's being done you keep a record of that so that if necessary uh if says if he says well she was supposed to pick up the kids on wednesday you have the record that that person sent a text on such and such a date at such and such a time with that type of language so the judge or the guardian ad litem or whoever is in charge has proof that they are the one responsible all you're doing is holding that person responsible for respect and the court of law will support you instead of the verbal abuser Wow, this this is so powerful, and the you know, and you are the master of language. That's mm -hmm. how I've always looked at you. You know, you just take you just go to a deeper way. We used to be able to talk to each other, you know, and everything is so polarized right now. <clears throat> I'm not political, but you know, I have certain strong views. People I've known for maybe forty, fifty years say, maybe they have a different view, but they're not even able to talk anymore. It's just like. People have and so how how do you how do you bridge those eggshells? You know, Chris, I hope people put in that left hand column a, a, a polar opposite opinion, right? Because okay. you and I both know family members that are not speaking to each other anymore right. because they have different political opinions or different opinions about vaccinations or right. or uh, some issue. Right. So I'm going to tell a short story because I learned this one the hard way. And then unpack it so that we actually have criteria that can help us decide how we can handle that relationship and have a hard conversation. Is that there's a woman in the speaking industry who's who is just renowned for her grace and her um, speaking ability and her leadership. We had monthly calls for years. And I was kind of shocked when several years ago, in the middle of a phone call, she said rather casually that she thought that the president at that time was the best president we'd ever had. Well, I thought just the opposite of that. And I couldn't believe that someone that I cared for so much could actually believe this. And at the end of the phone call, I did not know if we were ever going to talk again. Now, I was very fortunate because I grew up in Southern California on a horse. <laughs> and when we would go out riding across the country, there were riverbeds we would ride in that had quicksand. Now, did our parents say, nope, you can't go riding anymore because there's quicksand out there? No, they told us to keep away from the quicksand. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> And I realized here, here are the criteria. I hope everyone thinks of someone and they have a radically different view from someone that they care about, that they have a relationship. The question is, are they going to change your mind? Are you going to change their mind? Is going to the mat over this worth throwing away a five-year relationship, a 10-year relationship? I decided that instead of quitting the relationship, we were going to have a quicksand relationship. And that meant that politics was off limits right. and that we were going to focus on what we had in common instead right. of what we had in conflict. Right. And I think that that exactly bridges the gap because the, the politics is divisive, but when you get to the core, 
people kind of feel a lot of the same things. They may, ap you know, apply it differently or manage it. But if we took that away, I, there would be so much more agreement, I think. Maybe two-thirds of the population pretty much agrees, it seems, where more, just what I'm watching. See, you're bringing up a very good point, is that so if people are taking notes, it's a divisive opinion, and in the middle is focus on what we have in conflict, over right. on the right is focus on what we have in common. Yeah. It's like, are we going to change our mind? Are they going to change ours? No. Then instead of quitting the relationship, we have a quicksand relationship where we just we decide mutually right. decide that some things are off topic. Now, yeah. I was interesting because I was watching my favorite TV show, CBS Sunday Morning, and Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg was on, and the reporter said, "You go out to opera." with Judge Scalia, and you are on opposite ends of the political. How do you do that? Chris, she said the most profound six words. You know what she said? No. We are different. We are one. Uh, so in the middle column, different is wrong. In the right-hand column, different and one. Mm, nice. Beautiful. That's how you do it, right? Because that's the core. That's really the core. And and that would eliminate the war and the fighting. I mean, really, honestly, you know, you need to go into the, po you know, the political work. <laughs> oh. Okay. I like my life. I'm staying where I am. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> they need what you have, though. I'll just say that. Okay. <laughs> then then we have, you know, I was calling this segment three, which is the power of intrigue. And you're, you 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 have such a unique approach to communication. Well, thank you. It's a, as what you're referencing is the book is actually all right. What are some words to use and words to lose so that uh, we can keep our cool in the heat of the moment and actually mm -hmm. use words that help instead of hurt. Yeah. And then there's you know how to turn conflict into cooperation. You know what to do once again if people are blaming and fault finding. And then uh, there's a part hard conversations and, and high stakes situations. What can we do if we're walking into a negotiation? What can we do when we're standing up and going for a job interview or giving a presentation? And so if you would like, I could give an example about how we're talking on eggshells because there's a lot on the line, whether it's a negotiation or a presentation or a pitch. Would you like to hear that? Please. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. So I hope everyone thinks of something they care about, they want other people to care about. And what we don't do in the middle, so it's high stakes situation, whether it's a negotiation, interview, pitch, presentation, in the middle, don't explain your idea. <laughs> because explanations are infobesity. If we try and describe our cause or, or explain our product or tell people what it is that this is about, people are often confused. And when they're confused right now, Chris, crunch up your eyebrows, if you would. See, do you feel confused? It means confused mm. people don't say yes. Right. Now, if their eyebrows don't move, it means they're unmoved or they've had Botox. <laughs> <laughs> right. We want people's eyebrows up right now over yeah. on the right. How in the first 60 seconds, whether it's a negotiation pitch, can we get people's eyebrows up so they're intrigued? curious they want to know more which means we got just what we care about in their mental door now right. there's a very specific way to do that do we have time to share that absolutely please okay mm -hmm. you may know that i was the pitch coach for springboard enterprises which has helped women entrepreneurs generate 27 billion in funding and valuation and so one of my clients uh, kathleen calendar a pharma jet came she said i got good news and bad news I said, well, what's the good news? She said, I'm speaking in front of a, a room full of investors at the Paley Center in New York. I said, that's great news. What's the bad news? She said, I'm going at 2.30 in the afternoon, and I only have 10 minutes. She said, Sam, you can't say anything in 10 minutes. You can't talk about your team credentials, your competitive edge, your patent pending, your exit. Well, I said, you don't have 10 minutes. You have 60 seconds. Here is the opening we came up with that won her millions of dollars and Business Week's most promising social entrepreneur of that year. And then we'll unpack it for everyone who's watching. Sound good? Perfect. 
Okay, 60 second opening, here we go. Did you know there are 1.8 billion vaccinations given every year? Did you know up to a third of them are given with reused needles? Mm. Did you know we're spreading and perpetuating some of the very diseases we're trying to prevent? Imagine if there were a painless one use needle for a fraction of the current cost. You don't have to imagine it. We've created it. Chris, are your eyebrows up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know in the middle how she used to introduce herself? By saying that PharmaJet was a medical delivery device for subcutaneous inoculations. It's a what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, definitely got my attention. Yep. So if people are ask three, did you know questions? Did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know this? What are startling statistics about the need that you're meeting, the problem that you're solving, the issue that you're addressing? You can find those online. Just put into Google, what are startling statistics about blank? The industry that you're in or the problem that you're solving or the product that you're creating, et cetera. I wrote Next that down. Is, Oh, good. Did you know? Did you know? And look, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was that bad. I didn't know it was getting worse. I didn't know that many people were suffering from it, etc. Right. It's the quickest way to earn skeptics' attention. Mm -hmm. Second step, the word imagine. Because the word imagine pulls people out of their preoccupation because they're not distracted anymore. They're picturing your point. Right. Now, link the word imagine with three benefits of what it is you're recommending. So how will it save them money? How will it save them time? How will it increase their market share? How will it make them healthier? How will it help them sleep, et cetera? Imagine this and this and this. And people are going, sounds pretty good. <laughs> and then step three, you don't have to imagine it. We're doing it. Now come in with precedence or evidence to show this isn't speculative or pie in the sky. It's a done deal and you and your team are doing it. Or here's a testimonial. Here's where it's written up in an article. Look, all that is under 60 seconds. Mm -hmm. And turn a monologue into a dialogue. Got those eyebrows up. You have the gift, my friend. I mean, I'm like, oh, yeah. And I'm trying to write this down. And <laughs> because it's it, that for those first, the beginning of, of speaking with someone that that is that's a game changer right there and it's something that even like say in a personal business like one-on-one -on -one when i'm doing financial fitness strategy sessions this is the biggest thing that i haven't figured out because they want to do it but they procrastinate to the mm -hmm. last minute like you know they're going to wait till they pass away or something <laughs> instead of doing it when they're younger and, and there's so much emotion around money and planning that no you know that everybody runs from it and they don't they're not empowered and so that's what a lot you've helped me with to change the conversation how do you change that that procrastination and and move people to action good for you all right let's put over in the left hand column okay. is that someone is not taking action right they're they're not going to make a decision or they know it's important but they're putting it off yeah. well it's um John, I was speaking at Cisco and John Cotter, who is an expert on change, was the speaker before me. And he said, do you know what the number one prerequisite is for change? A sense of urgency. Mm. Right? Yeah. So if people are putting it off, it's because they think they can do it at any time. Right? right. It's like, well, I don't have to do it now. I can do it later. Right. Or there's not a compelling enough reason. It's like they do not anticipate what they're going to lose mm -hmm. is that big of a deal or what they gain is that big of a deal. So what I would do if I felt someone did not have urgency is I would help them project forward a year from now and then ask themselves if they would regret are, are they counting on, in fact, you know this, I wrote a book called Someday yeah. is Not a Day in the Week. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, you know, Chris, why I filled that book with quotes, Paulo Coelho said, one day you're going to wake up and there won't be any time left to do the things you've always wanted to do. Mm. Rene Ricard said, tomorrow is another day, but so was yesterday. <laughs> 
<laughs> John, John Legend said the future is already here and we are already late. Mm. So if people are not taking action, it is to ask a series of questions that help them self-reflect and realize they are probably counting on an automatic tomorrow. They are probably believing that at some point they'll be able to do this. Mm. Well, what if they won't? That often gives them the incentive to act now rather than later. Well, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Okay. So, I mean, we could talk for hours, but just to, just to talk a little bit about overcoming the fear of vulnerability and, mm. and explore the strategies for openness, honest and being vulnerable. You know, so put vulnerable if people are taking notes as a situation is that if we fear vulnerability, it is often because we think that people won't like us. If we tell our truth that they'll think that we're weak or that we are imperfect or that we uh, made a mistake and can't be trusted or that that we will hurt their feelings if we tell them we don't love them or whatever. It's really interesting, Chris, because it's kind of just the opposite is that when we have the courage to be vulnerable, we set a precedent where other people are inspired to respond in kind. So can I tell a quick story about this? Yes, please. Yes. So um, I was in, oh, this is another Andrew story. If we had more time, I would tell more Tom stories as well to keep <laughs> okay. it even there. Right. It's so I was uh, I was on a speaking tour. I was in New York and I had an opportunity to have dinner with my son, Andrew, before I needed to jump on a plane to D.C. So um, he knew that I was eating healthier at the time. So he made reservations at one of the top vegan restaurants, vegan restaurants Yay. in New York. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So so I got there and he texted me, says, Mom, I'm running late. Please go ahead and order and I'll be there in 15 minutes. And so I tell you, Chris, I looked at the menu and it was like broccoli here, tofu there, sprouts there. <laughs> I didn't see one thing that I thought I could eat, Chris. And mm -hmm. and finally, so I just ordered something. I ordered the only thing I thought I could get down. Well, so Andrew shows up on his skateboard. Yeah, I used to skateboard around New York. And he showed up just as the waiter came and set down Andrew's food and then set down a big plate of steaming linguine in front of me. And Andrew looked at the linguine, he looked at me. He looked at the linguine, he looked at me. He said, Mom, I thought you weren't eating pasta. I said, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at the linguine, he looked at me, he said, then why did you order the pasta? Now, I said, oh, Andrew, it's not a big deal. We only have an hour. I just want to get caught up. And he said, Mom, it is a big deal. You say you're not eating pasta, and then you eat the pasta. Now, see, internally, Chris, what I was thinking is he'd gone to all this big deal to make this reservation at this wonderful restaurant. We really only had a little time. I didn't want to like, well, I can't eat that, you know, and and I, I didn't want to make a big deal. And right. what he brought to my attention was that I was being disingenuous, that I was not mm -hmm. being honest, that right. I was not telling the truth. And right. he said, Mom, he said, what do you want? And I said, I want a steak. <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, we can do that. <laughs> and so he asked him to, to package up our food. There was a Whole Foods two blocks down. <laughs> I got some steak. We sat out in a park under a full moon and had a wonderful conversation. And we both got what we wanted, which was connection. Right. Connection right. is the result of having the courage to be vulnerable and to tell our truth because now people don't have to read between the lines. Now they don't have to second guess what we're saying. Now right. they don't have to wonder if we really mean it or if we're just trying to be nice yeah. or going along to get along. Yeah. Well, you taught him well. <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. <laughs> Both my sons are teaching me a lot. <gasps> what a gift. What a gift. Sam, you are a gift. And it's been, it's been a pleasure. I, and we could go on and we'll, we'll bring you back and do more deep dives because this is fun. Tell everybody how to get in touch with you, get your book, what you got going on and 
your contacts. Thank you. Yeah. Well, they're they're welcome to go to my website, which is easy to remember, Sam Horn, S-A-M. H-O-R-N dot com. I've got my TEDx talks are there. I've got posts, et cetera. I also hope they follow me on LinkedIn because my life is my lab and I love to write. So when I have a conversation with something, I get an idea, I write it on LinkedIn. If I give a presentation and the group really finds one particular technique very uh, useful, I write on LinkedIn. So it's a way for us to stay in touch and hopefully uh, to get current uh, suggestions about how we can talk authentically instead of talk on eggshells. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And I think it's so cosmic that you have the name Horn. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you know, because you, you're all about, you know, speaking and the words and, and all of, I just find this so fascinating. You know, I write songs, so, but you just have the you know, you just break apart the language, which empowers people. And everybody needs to go to your site because you have so much value there. And I'm, I'm just so glad to see you again and, and really appreciate you. Thanks, Chris. I, I, Catherine Graham of the Washington Post said to do what you love and feel that it matters. Mm. How could anything be more fun? That's what we get to do, right? Is to do right. what we love, feel that it matters, do it with people we enjoy and respect. So uh, wonderful reconnecting with you. And I hope people found this interesting and useful. Absolutely. Thank you so much. As we wrap up this truly enlightening episode, I want to express my gratitude to my exceptional guest, Sam Horn. Her insights into talking on eggshells have the power to transform not only the way you communicate, but also the way you connect with the world. If you've been inspired by today's conversation and you're hungry for more wisdom, make sure to subscribe, like, and share Money 911 on your preferred podcast platform. By doing so, you become a part of our mission to empower and uplift individuals on their financial and personal journeys. You can also find us live on the C-Suite TV network and our YouTube channel, Money 911, where you'll be able to see our beautiful faces and enjoy the journey. There's so much to learn about healthy money. I hope today's discussion brings you one step closer to securing and protecting your future. So you can get started on the right foot, go to meetwithchrismeller.com and schedule your free financial fitness strategy session. Thank you for listening and please subscribe to Money 911 so you don't miss our next episode, which includes health, wealth, and peace of mind.